All right. Yeah, my name is Sheree, and I'm um, excited to be here tonight with everyone. Um, it's really nice to see uh, a big interest in vermicomposting, um, using worms to make beautiful compost for your plants and your soil. Uh, the picture that you see here is the final product um, after it's been uh, screened of worm castings. And I'll uh, talk through the method of how, of how that happens in the next slides. So in vermicomposting, um, the sort of worms that are used are called red wigglers. And there's some differences between these worms and earthworms. Uh, the red wigglers tend to live in the upper, probably about four to six inches of the, of the surface level. Um, and so that's why it's important to keep that upper level of your bin system at a good moisture level and not have it get too hot or too cold. And um, so they do not burrow like earthworms do. Earthworms tend to be more burrowing down in a way and can go fairly deep. And um, earthworms are more of creating um, air and water pathways and creating nice soil structure. Um, whereas red wigglers are really great at eating and um, breaking down organic matter um, where they can eat up to their body mass per day. Um, and earthworms really don't um, do that sort of thing of breaking down organic matter. Um, red wigglers also thrive in confinement and they can handle disturbance, whereas earthworms um, do not like those things. And this is important because um, in any sort of worm system, they're going to be confined, um, but they're not going to be burrowing out in a way like an earthworm would and escaping. And as you're sifting through your worm castings, you will be disturbing the worms. Um, but if you do it at, you know, a good time of year where it's not too hot and not too cold, um, they really don't mind a little bit of disturbance. So that's why they are used um, in this composting method. Uh, this is a picture of a large outdoor system. Um, you can see that straw bells are used for the walls uh, to hold everything in, and it also insulates the worms in the summer and the winter months. Uh, there is irrigation that goes off once a week that keeps the system damp, so not wet. Uh, you don't want it wet, like if you're squeezing out a sponge and having water come out, that would be too wet, but you want it to be like a damp sponge. Um, and yeah, so this is a system that's been in place for one year and it is a fairly large system um, for an outdoor worm bin. And it took me about 20 hours approximately to go through and sift the worm castings out of a system this size. So in thinking about the size of your worm bin in your yard or in your home, size does matter with how much organic matter you're inputting, um, with how much worm casting as you will get. And it does take time to sort through the worm casting. So that is something to take into consideration. So this worm bin will be retired this fall and um, a thick layer of straw will be put on top about six to 12 inches and that will insulate the worms through the winter. The irrigation will be turned off during the winter months and then organic matter will be uh, placed into the new bin. So in dismantling uh, the the two-year-old bin. This is the view from the other side. Um, where the shovel is, is the last corner 
of the two-year-old bin where I've been sorting through the worm compost and extracting the worm, com the worm castings. I'll explain that method here. So where the shovel was, you can see that's all been dismantled and sifted through and this new bin has been installed and is in place for when the bin on the right is retired this fall uh, and covered up. The irrigation can be moved over to have that start next spring and organic matter can be, start, be started to add to the new bin on the left uh, this fall. And then that bin on the right, I will um, sort through those worm castings next April and dismantle that and repeat the process. <clears throat> okay, so the screening of the castings um, is using uh, this wire. There's a thick, uh, a wider gauge wire and a finer gauge wire that is used. So the wider gauge wire um, is placed on top of the finer gauge and then shovelfuls of the worm compost is placed on top of the wider gauged wire and using like this hoe implement, um, just going back and forth finer materials will fall down onto the second screen and then what you'll have left are rocks and broken down, not broken down twigs and like woody debris, um, not broken down like straw, like really chunky stuff. And I tend to just uh, throw that sort of thing like on the ground and not necessarily like back into the bin because they're not gonna be able to be broken down. Um, you can see the picture on the left, there are some eggshells that were not broken down and those do take a while longer. And I tend to just throw those back into the system and, so that they can go and be processed for another round because they will break down, they just take a little longer. So then you have your finer screen here and you do the same thing, you go back and forth with this hoe or whatever implement you have. And the worm final worm castings will be falling down into the wheelbarrow. And what you'll have left on the picture on the right in the corner is unbroken down debris that can be thrown back into the um, system to have, you know, be gone through another round and broken down. And then there's the picture again of the final worm castings. Um, a couple of indoor examples, uh, both of these use uh, bins that kind of nest into one another. The picture on the left has like a, a holding tray that collects any excess water or um, worm uh, tea and that can be drained off and fed to your house plants and other plants, really nutritious. And um, as the bins fill up, uh, other bins can be nested on top and there's holes on the bottom where the worms, worms will go up into the um, more empty bin up above as the other ones get filled. And the picture on the right is a picture uh, a system that a person had made with totes lying around and they just put the some holes around the sides for air ventilation and on the bottom for worms to go up into the next bin as the bins get filled and bolts to kind of nest the bins into one another. Uh, with these smaller in-home systems. Uh, it is important to have them inside during the winter because uh, they are so small they will freeze and then the worms will freeze and die and we don't want that to happen. Um, the picture on the right, the people did have this outside on their porch. Uh, so uh, just because they did not want to have uh, a fly issue with their house plants and so that is something to take into consideration with a home system. <clears throat> 
Um, I found a way to alleviate that is to be really careful with how much liquid uh, goes into the system. Uh, so I have some other examples of outdoor systems. This was one where the person had this pre-existing uh, fencing and we just put an interior wall and then they had straw bells that had been lying around for a long time. Those were taken apart and uh, put in there and smashed in there to create that insulative uh, wall barrier for the to protect the worms and a layer of straw on the ground and then they have their irrigation where, where they'll raise that irrigation up as the pile um, goes you know increases in size and uh, yeah and then lots of organic matter for the worms to feed on this is another system that a person has set up that's about half the size of the, the first system that I showed you. Um, they have placed some hoops over that they're going to have some shade cloth uh, to protect the worms during the hot summer months, which I thought was really nice. And uh, there again is the irrigation to keep the um, moisture level at a damp level. Um, they did change out this irrigation because we found it was a little bit too much moisture. Uh, so what we are looking at um, to keep worms happy and to keep our worm castings in production is the moisture level that I've been speaking about. Not too wet, not dry, just right. Uh, you can really use your nose uh, to gauge whether if something is getting too wet, it will smell uh, kind of rotten or anaerobic and then that maybe you would cut your water down or you would add some dry debris such as uh, dried leaves or straw. And then you are wanting to give them lots of stuff to eat. Uh, so any vegetative matter. Um, you do not want to add anything that's too coarse like any twigs or branches. You would not want to add in anything coarse like a sunflower stalk. Uh, but any flower heads, um, any leaves, um, and all, any and all kitchen scraps um, are the only things I've found that tend to take a little bit longer to break down in terms of kitchen scraps are again eggshells and avocado pits and avocado skins. And with those I'll just throw them into the other system and they'll continue to break down. They just take longer. And really everything else, you know, with compost you don't want to add um, meat. I found that um, bones will not be broken down. So you want to stay away from that and just add uh, plant material and um, kitchen scraps. And with the idea of like a coarseness, like you can add like a broccoli stock, like um, that's not too woody, um, but maybe anything like more coarse than that would be something you would just put into your uh, regular compost system. And um, I did measure the temperature at that first system that I showed pictures of and uh, a comparable one that I set up this year. And in the heat of the summer a couple of weeks ago when it was 105, 107 degrees, um, both of those systems were sitting at 80 degrees. And that was with a nice insulation of straw bells and a nice moisture level. So if you maintain those things, then it will create a nice temperature environment for, for the worms to live. And then you end up with this um, amazing pile of gold um, that is really worth a lot of money. If you buy worm castings, they can be kind of expensive as, as an amendment. And uh, I mean, this pile is probably 20, or 30 wheelbarrow loads. It's pretty big from that one 
system at the beginning of the slideshow, just to give you an idea of what two years of uh, having a worm system could potentially give you if you are adding a lot of organic matter and kitchen scraps. And um, all of this can be used around in your garden, your house plants, um, just giving nutrition into your soil, adding nice soil structure for your plants, giving health and vitality to your plants, and then the production of your plants, uh, you know, will be increased and the food that you eat from your plants will have uh, more nutrition. So it's a win-win situation where you're adding in inputs that maybe you'd be throwing away and it's a relatively uh, inexpensive uh, method of composting. And um, yeah, I think that's um, the basics that I was going to cover and um, Roz was going to present next and um, any questions that have not been answered, you know, with her presentation, we um, will have a Q&A after she's done sharing. So thank you. So very excited to talk about worms. I haven't talked about vermicomposting in a couple of years and it was great to refresh some of the science that I had researched previously and also bin structures. My experience has been with indoor worm composting, so that's what I'll share with you all today. And I'll move you all so I can see you closer to the camera so it doesn't look like I'm looking away from you. There we go. Okay. So uh, yes, worm humor is always appreciated. Hope you enjoyed the joke. And I'll start off with uh, sharing about indoor systems. And so with indoor systems, uh, Cherie's larger scale design allows for year long outdoor room composting, which is very exciting. But for many of us, we don't have a large landscape to allow for an outdoor system of that scale. So for those in that category, an indoor system would make more sense. And you saw some pictures in her presentation of examples of indoor systems, less insulation on the outside, which is why it's important to bring those systems in when it starts to the weather starts to turn towards winter. And then, of course, you can bring them out again in the summer keeping an eye that they aren't scorched in, especially in the summer sun, if they're in sun, ideally they're in a shady area and um, you'll just wanna monitor the temperature of those bins. Ideally that would be between 55 and 77 degrees. So just a uh, best practice there for that. So let's talk some about indoor systems. So how to create your indoor vermicompost. There's some key essential materials you'll all need. The first is the bin and you can get creative with what type of bin that you use. So you can use old buckets or garbage cans, uh, some rubber and plastics, um, plastic bins. They're cheap and to use and durable. You can find them at the grocery store. Even better for an environmental footprint is if you find a bin at the thrift store. And we've done that in the past, found some great bins that we've shared with kids at sustainability camps to build vermicompost systems with. So something that was used and discarded and then we've turned that into a vermicomposting system. And so one thing to be careful of is if you are using a bin that has had any chemical treatments and um, that worms are sensitive creatures and you'll want to make sure that you're um, choosing a bin that has um, does not leach any chemicals into your system and that will also eventually harm your soil as well. Um, wood bins would eventually um, decompose slightly over time so that's something to keep in mind but they'll definitely work and so um, you can use wood systems and that would be a long-term consideration but for um, several years a wood bin would be fine. So yeah, your ingredients, you have the, the bin itself, the bedding. So you for bedding, I have a picture here of uh, shredded office paper. That's a great thing to use for people like myself that work in an office environment. There's a plethora of shredded paper to be found. And uh, it feels really good bringing home that shredded paper from, from work and using that in a system to improve your soil. Uh, newspaper scraps are great as well. You can just rip those up and put them in your system. You know, want to rip them as, as small as possible. So it's great if you're watching a Zoom pod or Zoom webinar or a podcast, listening to a podcast, something like that, you can occupy your time because uh, we like to multitask but don't do so very effectively when we're on a Zoom call and we start to email or something because then we, our thoughts get lost in that. But if you do something like shred paper on a call, you'll still be paying attention and then you'll be accomplishing another task, which we all love to do. 
Peat moss is another option that people use as bedding material, but it's less sustainable. So that's a consideration to keep in mind uh, as well. And so just some sort of bedding for the worms to have, and that also helps keep fly populations low. Um, and then some sort of grit. So worms grind food down in their gizzards. So if you didn't know that worms had gizzards, now you do. And their gizzards require some form of grit to help break food down. And so you can add a small amount of sand or similar material to your bedding. And lastly, Sheree covered the water. So you'll want to make sure that the water is uh, to the moisture level of a wrung out sponge. And so that sponge shouldn't, um, wouldn't if you squeezed it, it wouldn't be dripping water, but it would be wrung out, but it'd feel moist, but not be uh, dripping or running water when you squeeze that. Okay, so creating your indoor system. So to prepare your container, what I've done in the past is I've drilled several dozen small holes in the top, so your lid, and then the, the top of the sides, so around the, the top of the sides of the bin. And untreated wood bins are naturally ventilated, so you wouldn't need to worry about holes necessarily unless it's extremely tightly built, then you'll want to drill some in there. And uh, you'll fill your bin with organic substrate. So um, that includes those strips of newspaper or office paper and you sprinkle a handful of dirt and sand on top and thoroughly moisten, moisten. So obviously, as you can see by these pictures, much smaller than what Cherie was showing. This is an extremely small system that maybe you'd wanna put under your kitchen sink or something. And that system that's shown in, next to that image too, that would work well if you have multiple bins of that size that you could stack and drill holes in the bottom so that are large enough for the worms to migrate as, uh, so you feed on the bottom and then once uh, that's full and to your liking, then you can start feeding on the next layer and the worms will eventually, once they've worked through the bottom, work their way up the system. And so that's uh, the second part of that. Um, and then also the, the water factor as well. So again, like a wrung out sponge. Next, you add your worms and food scraps. And I recommend for these systems to feed worms in quadrants, as you can see in that uh, third image on the, the slide. And so um, that's a great practice to, uh, to have in your indoor system. So drill, um, with that, uh, you can, you'll can you feed in quadrant one, then two, then three, then four, and then you can harvest in that same order uh, as the, the contents are consumed by the worms. And so with harvesting that, the castings, there's different techniques that you can use. And this one, this, the picture shown in next to the number four, the entire layer is ready for harvesting at this point. And so you can see that's worm compost because there's still food scraps and other material in there. Worm castings are what Cherie showed in her slide of after having screened through everything, that fine, beautiful, um, finished product that she had from her systems. So the, one technique could be a push and wait technique. And so you push contents to one side of the bin and restock the other with your fresh bedding. And this relates more to those quadrants that I showed. So you're pushing them to a side and then you're feeding in the next area, either half or quadrant, and you wait patiently. And this will take a couple of months for those worms to fully start using that other side and then you can harvest. Another technique is an expose and scrape, I call it. And so that's when you expose the bin contents to the light and then you scrape off a thin layer. Um, and then you go ahead and you uh, scrape the next or the next exposed layer and work your way down about up to one inch uh, and the, the worms will move below that to escape the light. They are very, uh, they're very sensitive to light. And so that's, those are two techniques for harvesting worms out of a small indoor system. And so here's a picture of some contents from worm bins. And um, this is the picture on the left is someone creating the, um, mixing those ingredients together for the bins. They have some grit in there, some bedding, some food scraps, and uh, more bedding will be added. Can you tell me in the chat quickly what is missing in that picture of the essentials that are needed in a worm bin? Okay, so the answer for that one was um, that there's moisture that's not in the system yet. So uh, you'll need to add that moisture. And there's also no holes drilled around the top. If you're really savvy with worm bins at this point, you might have guessed that one as well. I couldn't see what people were writing as answers for that one. <laughs> 
This slide that I had actually skipped to a second ago is showing some indoor bin designs. And so the picture of the beige bin in the top corner is uh, similar to bins that Cherie had shown. And you can stack those into each other and they have ventilation built in. And then they have the ventilation at the top. And children love helping, um, especially using power tools. Uh, remember to provide a safety talk beforehand if having kids engaged. So this was a young man at a previous sustainability camp that I was helping run in Park City and he's drilling his worm bin here, um, drilling those holes out and then he'll clean up the sharp ends that are drilling into the plastic to allow um, great ventilation into the bin. Worms will only try to escape up through those holes if your bin, is, if there's something wrong with the ingredients of your bin. So we have those perfect ingredients of the bedding, the grit, the food scraps, and the worms, and the moisture level. And if any of those get too off balance, your bin will start to turn anaerobic and start to smell funky. And when that smell, you all know that smell when, you, when you'll experience it, occur is your worms will start to escape or try to escape. And so um, they're a great signal that there's something off in your bin as well. When you start seeing worms going up the side, trying to leave the bin, they're trying to escape an unhealthy environment. Okay, so keeping a healthy bin involves a few living essentials. The first is of course the worms. So the worms role in a worm, worm composting system is to provide an aerobic unaerobic, not unanaerobic. So they provide that aerobic and therefore uh, odor-free environment and they're consuming material and producing those nutrient-rich castings, which are the outcome that we're hoping from for our bins. And a healthy bin also entails inclusion of microorganisms, so namely bacteria and fungi. Those are part of a system as well, working together to break down your food. So how do they do that? Bacteria use a variety of enzymes to break down organic material by oxidizing it and providing them with the resources they need to grow and reproduce. A byproduct of the oxidation process is that the heat, heat is generated. And so what Cherie said with um, measuring the temperature of those bins, even when it was extremely hot outside, it was maintaining a great heat environment, the bacteria play a role in that process and create ideal conditions for even more um, voracious microorganisms to exist. And so also part of that equation are of course fungi and those are the molds and yeast in a composting system. They break down tougher debris, which enables bacteria to continue the decomposition process. So all of it's working together. There's a missing living organism that's an essential in your worm composting system that I did not mention, and that is you. So you're an, a critical player in helping to maintain the balance and health of your system by monitoring the smell, making sure you're still feeding the, the worms in the system and that they aren't escaping or trying to. I've experienced that once with them all trying to escape and it's kind of sad. So, um, but you can easily rebalance it and then sort that problem out. So now I'm going to dive into, after hearing some about how to build your indoor system and uh, the essentials you need for that, um, some of the more detail about um, red worms versus earthworms, why we want to use red worms in systems, it, a little bit more detail than what Cherie had um, introduced us to with that part, and how red worms function and reproduce, and then benefits of the final product. So just a few more slides focused on worms specifically. Okay, so red worms versus earthworms. Here's a picture of both to give you a visual of what those two look like. So red wigglers are composting worms and they process large amount of organic waste daily. So they process actually up to their full body weight every day. It's a lot if you think about eating, you know, me, I'm around 145 pounds. If I ate that much food in a day, that's just crazy to think about, but worms can handle that. And they can also, red worms can handle disturbances and they thrive in confinement. Whereas earthworms, they don't process large amounts of organic waste like red worms do. They cannot eat up to their body weight in a day. And they do not thrive well in confinement either. And they also don't deal well with disturbance. So they aren't a great option for your worm composting system. We want to use red worms. And so here on this slide, we see worm guru Mary Applehoff saying the most satisfactory kind of worm to use in your vermicomposting system referring to red worms. And other people have called them in the past red wigglers, manure worms, red hybrids, tiger worms, stripe worms, etc. And these are some examples of favorable worm varieties that you could use. 
So some neat facts about worms and specifically red worms, they breathe through their skin and although they have no eyes, their skin cells are very sensitive to light and te the technical term for that is photophobic. And so uh, that's why they'll escape that light if you're doing the expose and scrape method for harvesting. According to Oregon State University Extension, they reproduce rapidly after they reach sexual maturity. So usually 30 to 45 days after hatching and they can double their population in about 60 days, which is really impressive, which is why so many people starting a worm composting system just take a cu couple handfuls or even one handful of worms from someone to start their system if they have the time to let that uh, grow on its own. And they're also, um, they're hermaphrodites, which means that each worm has both sexes. But a neat fact about that is that a worm must mate with another worm to reproduce, even though they're hermaphrodite. So in simple terms, each worm transfers its sperm to the other as they lie head and tail next to each other. A mucus collar is produced, and uh, this is an raised band circling the worm's body, and that eventually forms a cocoon. So a cocoon is smaller than a grain of rice, and those of you with worm bins already know what that looks like. A mature worm can produce up to four yellow lemon-shaped cocoons per week, so 100 per year, and hatching two to five worms in about three weeks. Young worms are whitish with a central pink tinge showing their blood vessels, and so it's neat to see those baby worms in your system and um, fun to observe that. So when you see those small uh, grain of rice um, items in your worm system, you'll know that that's the cocoon um, that's producing baby worms or about to hatch. So what can you and what can you not feed your worms? There is some discussion of that happening in the chat. So a general rule of things, great things to feed your worms include shredded paper, um, fruit, fruit and vegetables, trimmings, grains, beans, or bread, but that's bread without butter, margarine, or mayonnaise, so the, not those oily products. Eggshells, but as Sheree mentioned, you might have to filter those out and put them back in your system to help break down. Fawn leaves, tea bags, coffee grounds, and filters are great to have because they also serve the role of that grit that the worms need in their gizzards. Lawn clippings and weeds, and however, you do not want to place the following in a worm bin. Meat products, dairy products, and oily products. As a general rule, they avoid those products and that could also cause your system to start to smell funky um, and turn anaerobic. So that's the do's and don'ts of feeding your worms. Now here is the great slide of what's in it for me. So why should you do this? Why should you compost with worms? Well, Cornell Extension has eight great reasons as to why. I'll, stop, I'll end with the reasons that I share generally with people. So the eight reasons why to uh, start a worm compost bin according to Cornell Extension include, first of all, uses up your kitchen scraps. Second, it works as in, indoor or works indoor year round. Third, it's convenient and compact, and compact and neat. And four, is ideal for apartment dwellers. Five, it reduces waste sent to the landfill. Six, it teaches kids and adults about small scale ecosystems. Seven, produces an abundance of fishing worms if you like to go fishing. And eight produces castings, which are nutrient, uh, which is a nutrient rich addition to your house plants, flower and vegetable beds, providing an excellent amendment for your soil. So a great quote that uh, I like to tell people is compost improves aeration and drainage in clay soils, holds moisture in sandy soils, eases cultivation, acts as a disease suppression, balances pH and helps all soils re resist crusting, erosion, and leaching of nutrients. Worm castings are the most nutrient-rich, pH-balanced, and consistent of all composts. And that quote comes as well from Cornell Extension. So when I share people a quick, uh, quick information about the benefits of composting, worm composting systems, these include that they increase moisture and nutrient retention in your soil. So that's really great, especially for areas uh, like Utah, which are anticipated to become hotter and drier over time. Many areas of the US are experiencing that. And so applying worm compost can actually increase that moisture and nutrient retention of your soil. And also, like I mentioned before, it lessens crusting and other physical damage common to soils, especially in arid climates like our own here in Utah. So with the nutrients that are provided in worm compost, first of all, these nutrients uh, or this worm compost contains more nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium than farmyard manure. 
And also the micronutrients present are, um, they contain more manganese, copper, zinc, iron, and the same amount of magnesium as farmyard manure minerals. And they're so nutrient rich that uh, generally we spread them around plants, but um, that's just a general rule with uh, worm compost.